Jesus, thank you, thank you for the words of these songs, lyrics that only you have earned, Jesus, by who you are and what you've done. You have changed everything. We have hope because of your great and awesome sacrifice for our brokenness. So thank you, Jesus. We are a child of God, and your fire is lit inside of us. We love you. Bless your word now. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for the seventh consecutive year, we are going to extend an invite to you to consume copious amounts of fried calories at the Shack Hamburger Resort on Tuesday at noon, New Year's Eve. This is the original location of Shack on Cypress Rose Hill, and they have an abandoned school bus in the back where our students like to hang out, and we sometimes take pictures. Uh, this is one of the unhealthiest restaurants in the city of Houston. You only want to eat at this place once a year. And I will bring the AED with me just in case you decide to wash down your burger and onion rings with not just apple pie, but deep fried apple pie that is topped with bacon and powdered sugar just in case your heart was not being pressed to its limits already. So really, this is just a chance for us to say thank you to God for his faithfulness in 2019 and to thank him in advance for what he's going to do in 2020 and hope to see you there. We always have a big crowd. Just show up and say you are with Life Path Church. We will all sit together, and that is this Tuesday at noon. So as you know, or maybe you have not considered this, this is your last sermon of the decade. What do you think about that? It's 2019, and we are about to head into 2020. This is going to be the year of the meme. You have already seen memes for 2020, and it would not be right for me to not have a cheesy title for this sermon. We all love to pass churches and read their cheesy church signs, okay? I think my all-time favorite cheesy church sign is God answers Nemail. <laughs> yes, this is why people do not believe in God and why do they not, why they do not go to church. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, I did. I had to give you a cheesy uh, sermon title this morning of Is Your Vision 2020? 2020? Yes, yes. Are you seeing 2020 spiritually? So uh, I, I readily acknowledge this is a cheesy title to a sermon. Uh, but of course, we're making New Year's resolutions. Uh, for whatever reason, we are controlled by a calendar. Our God is timeless. There is no calendar with our God. But for whatever reason, when January 1st hits, we feel like we get a fresh start, a new beginning. Now, we're going to find out spiritually that's happening every day. We do not have to wait until January 1st. But what is the most popular New Year's resolution? I heard the word wait and lose a lot in there. Yes, number one New Year's resolution is lose weight and get fit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Here at Life Path Church, we made our building look as approachable as possible. This church is not fancy on the outside by design, deliberate, because we want everyone to feel welcome in this place. We are a come-as-you-are church. We are a flawed bunch of believers saved by the grace of God. And our building is a community church. It is used throughout the week, and sometimes it gets damaged. But every one of us at the same time knows that we also take great pride in this building, in how it's decorated, not just at Christmas, but throughout the year. The landscaping, Sue Bright and her team, we take great pride in this gift from God. That is how your body should be used in the service of God. It should be used. And sometimes there are going to be some bruises 
some cuts. But when non-believers see us, they should still see someone who obviously cares about their temple. Cares about the temple of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now, we are all going to die. That is not breaking news. But we do have some control over the decisions we make and our health. Like I said, you could eat at Shack once, but if you ate there every dinner, have mercy. No amount of prayer is going to help you, right? You cannot have a deep fried existence, right? So yes, it is always the most popular New Year's resolution. All the gyms and fitness centers get really excited. They make a lot of money in January. <laughs> And then it's over. Okay, another popular New Year's resolution. What about a new hobby? You want to learn something new. Look at Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Any of us in here around teenagers, and they will not be mad at me for saying this. They know they do this. How annoying is it when you're like a grown adult and they act like they know everything, right? You're like, do you think you're going to be smarter 30 years from now? Yes, I sure hope so. Okay, that's me. <laughs> I know more than you. I will tell you there's something even more annoying, though. It's even more annoying when you see an adult, an elderly person who stops learning. I love my father-in-law. We call him Pop. I think he is listening right now to the live stream. What I love about Pop is he never stops learning. Learning does not scare him. Technology does not scare him. He will know as much as I do or even more. He has this learner's heart. He keeps growing. So you're going to hear a lot of New Year's resolutions today. Maybe this is the one that will speak to you Maybe this is your weakness, but I want you to find one or two in this mix because we're going to be moving fast, so you got to keep up. But I want one or two that you will accept as a challenge. Maybe have someone hold you accountable. Also look at Proverbs 9.9 9 for that new hobby. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. So I have purchased the app Duolingo, and I'm going to learn Spanish this year. And I'm going to, I have already asked Jackie Martinez to challenge me every now and then. Hey, can you say something to me in Spanish? Let me ask you a question. Can you uh, let me know what I just said? Can you translate the Spanish? Uh, how are you doing? I want to encourage you. Um, I am going to learn Spanish. Not really a hobby, but you understand what I mean. And look, look, Philippians chapter 4 here. Or Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. This is right after Jesus was found in Jerusalem. After he was missing for about three days, his parents did not know. They were in a large caravan of people, thought he was elsewhere in that uh, large assembly of exiting Jerusalem. And they found him in the temple. And this is how Luke ends that story. The only story we have of Jesus when he was 12 years old. Only story as a child. And Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew mentally and stature. He grew physically. And in favor with God, he grew spiritually. And in favor with man, he grew socially. Jesus had to grow in every way. He was the son of God, but he had to put in the work. He had to grow as a person to become that mature follower of God, even though he was God. And I know that's hard to wrap our minds around, fully God, but also fully human. What about this get out of debt? Is that a popular New Year's resolution? Get out of debt. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And you may think, I do not serve money. I have no interest in serving money. I only want to serve God. But the problem is the debt demands our attention. It compels us to follow it. Because it's always there just reminding us that you have me in your life. And I know you don't like me, but I am here until you get rid of me. And sometimes it's impossible to avoid 
There may be an accident in your family, and maybe the medical insurance, maybe the deductible, all that stuff. There's only so much we can control, but certainly when we can control it, we should. We should. Uh, so maybe that's your New Year's resolution. What about less stress? Anyone want some less stress in life? Okay, uh, look at Matthew chapter 6, a passage familiar to us. But you know, it sounds like Jesus just said it like now. <laughs> Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And we know that the damage of stress on our physical health is well documented. Jesus spoke it way back. <laughs> and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. So if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, it's kind of interesting to think that no tomorrow has ever existed. I just blew Marty's mind. Because once tomorrow comes, it becomes... Yes, today, exactly, yes, Ethan, yes, students listening in the sermon. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and peti petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, and this is what I want you to really hear from this passage, when you are stressed and you are worried and you're aware that you are about to lose it, maybe on your spouse, maybe on your child, let this verse, just let it simmer in your mind, in your heart. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In that moment where you are about to lose it from stress, just remember God's faithfulness. It may not solve your problems. You're still going to have to face whatever it is you have to face but hopefully be reminded that you're not alone in that moment, okay? That there are many pure things in your life, admirable things in your life, noble things in your life that you can claim and that can equip you, can give you that strength to get through that moment, right? Because stress is always going to be there. It's how we handle it uh, that makes all the difference. What about more time with family? Is that a resolution that maybe we need more time with family? Maybe a goal of dinner around the table one night a week, because this is hard. Schedules are all over the place. Um, this is from 1 Timothy. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Ouch. That is intense. And of course, we all have family in this place and maybe some broken relationships, some forgiveness that needs to be offered or forgiveness that needs to be received. I have been working extra hard on renewing my relationship with my younger brother over the past year, doing things with him. His family just stayed at my house one night trying to rekindle that connection recognizing that this is important, being my blood relative. 
I know sometimes we call family, especially students, will call their best friends, brothers and sisters. And as Christians, you are my brothers and sisters. But there is something special about family. There is something unique about your biological relatives, uh, even if they are weird, even if you do not get along, even if they drive you crazy, even if they have annoying habits. We're all contributing to that mess. We are all flawed. We give it and we take it, right? Amen? And this is very important for us to remember that to God, uh, taking care of your family, being there for them, is critically important uh, to your faith in God. What about going on a vacation, seeing new places? And how many of us, when we go on a vacation, no offense to all of you, but I want to get away from all of you, <laughs> right? And I can say that because you're probably thinking the same thing. You want to get away from people when we go on a trip. We want to see the Grand Canyon, but not with a thousand people in our picture. You know, I don't want everyone I know photobombing my picture of the Grand Canyon, right? But listen, but, but listen, Luke chapter 13 and verse 29. This is a description of heaven. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. If you go on a vacation this year, if that's one of your New Year's resolutions, even if it's still here in America, you are going to meet different people. Get off the tourist path. Meet some locals. Ask them questions. Get to know the culture. Because human beings, out of all creation, out of the ginormity of the universe, the smallness of the universe, only human beings are made in the image of God. Yes, the Grand Canyon will stop you when you see it. But it was made for us, not us for it. Human beings point to God. Human beings have the breath of God. So when you go to a place, yes, maybe you are getting away from people, but remember that you are going to be seeing these people around heaven's banquet table. People of different skin color. People from different countries. People from different political parties. Ouch, from the pastor sitting on the front row. <laughs> People matter more than anything. So maybe that's your New Year's resolution. Okay, got to have some spiritual resolutions here since we're followers of Jesus. What do you think is the number one spiritual resolution for a Christian? Oh, to read the Bible. But it's not just that. You have to read the Bible through in one year. Otherwise, God does not love you anymore. <laughs> yeah, good luck getting through Leviticus. And I don't want to hear your, your complaints and your whining about Leviticus, son, because you still have numbers following Leviticus. If you thought Leviticus was hard, where did we get the idea that somehow God is not pleased with us if we don't read the Bible through in a year? We see all these plans, we feel all this pressure, we get started and about you know, two or three weeks in, you know, we skip a chapter and it's like, <laughs> God hates me. You know? And we feel so guilty. Why? Yes, we should read the Bible more. But honestly, sometimes one chapter will challenge you in a way where you will need to chew on that for a few days. Maybe one verse that you want to put to memory that really just lifts your spirits and you want to claim the promise of that one verse. Remember, there were, there were no chapter numbers and verses originally. This is all one story of God's reconciliation, God's plan to make us right with him again through the blood of Jesus. So yes, by all means, read the Bible. But don't, but don't put that pressure on yourself. If you're not a reader, trying to read it through in a year is a big deal. You know, just be in the word. Just be in the word, amen? What about another spiritual re resolution of loving better? Loving better. And I don't mean the people that already love you back. 
So the Cardozo family, I love how you sit up close. You are such an affectionate family. I love how you hug on each other. But right now, I'm not talking about the obvious love you have for each other when I say love better. Look at Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain like he did this morning on the righteous and the unrighteous here in Houston. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Yes. Yes. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. There's a New Year's resolution for you. Hey, we need you to be perfect this year. Like, can you even pull off one day? <laughs> Not me, right? Of course, what God, Jesus is saying here is we should seek to be holy as God is holy. Obviously, we will never be perfect, but that should be our heart's desire to continue to grow in our faith and be more like the holy God we serve. But when I say love better, I'm talking about loving that person that's most difficult to love in your life. Or maybe it's another religion. Maybe it's a race of people. Maybe it's a political party. We need to love better. Maybe that'll be your spiritual goal. What about serve better? Serve better. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So students, when we were wrapping presents at Barnes and Noble, that is an act of worship. You're offering your body in the name of Jesus to serve. That's an act of worship, right? We need to serve better. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. If you're like, I have nothing to offer. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If you're an outgoing person, can I ask, why are you not yet a greeter at our front door? If you're outgoing and you're not doing this yet, why not? We need you. You know, if you're not scared of a crowd and walking down front and you never have dreams about doing that when you're not wearing any clothes, um, be an usher. There is no one standing in your way to be an usher. You have a gift. I let students draw on Wednesday night. I have quiet students that have a little bit of social anxiety. They bring their sketchbooks on Wednesday night. I let them draw and create art while we're worshiping, while I'm sharing a message. I'm fine with that. Use your gifts that God's given you. Little Jennifer, a Wednesday night student, just the art just started pouring out of her. If you're a creative type, you know what I mean. Sometimes it just has to come out. And she created a stack of art. And she's like, what do I do with this? I have no room in my room. So we spread out her art on the stage and students came forward and took her art home. So now there's like a little piece of Jennifer hanging on the wall in my office, maybe in your room. And that's what I'm talking about. Using your gifts, serving better. And look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Your life needs to be recognized with many acts of kindness, tangible acts of serving. These are not big things that change the world, that solve problems. It's just you in that moment recognizing that it is sacred. And just by doing the dishes when my mom has not asked me to, or just by um, giving an encouragement note to a co-worker who's had a tough week and has been mean to everyone, but I know he's going through stuff at home. I'm going to give him an encouraging note. Just these little things together as a body of Christ have supernatural impact. Amen. What about this one? And it's going to sound weird because you're already here. What about a New Year's spiritual resolution of attending church? This passage is historically used in weddings, 
and I'm not a big fan of using it, not just because of the traditional implications. If you're a woman in here, you will understand what I mean. But for another reason, which I will explain at the end of the passage. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. But holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Listen carefully. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is not a passage ultimately about marriage. Paul is using the example of marriage as an analogy that we are the bride of Christ and that Jesus died for the church. Now, yes, we all know that person. I hate organized religion. I worship God when I'm fishing on my canoe. You probably do. But that is not this. Your presence here is critical. We have enough members of this church to fill this space, I bet, I don't know, two or three times, you think? And you still see some empty seats. We have people that show up once a month, twice a month, and believe me, those dedicated that are here every Sunday, we notice, and you encourage us immensely because we know it takes sacrifice to be here, and there's no way you can be here every Sunday. Something will happen, something unforeseen, some surprise in your life, an illness, but I hope you hear me when I say this. Church attendance is so important. Jesus died for it. It's kind of a big deal. If something else is in your life that prevents you from being here, you need to examine that. You need to get down on your knees with the Lord and talk to him about this. Because this is not me saying it. It's God's word saying it. Being here as a body of Christ, this is something that's entirely biblical. Wednesday night is kind of a traditional thing that we do. And it's awesome for our youth group, for our students who are Wednesday night only students. And they still call this their church home. But Sunday morning, this is special. This is the body of Christ at this particular geographical address. And you are needed. Don't think you're not. You are noticed. I stand in the back when Pastor Elliot preaches. For that very reason, I'm looking at every one of you individually. The backs of your heads. But for some of you, that's an improvement. <laughs> that's, 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 I just kidding. I just kidding. I just kidding. I just kidding. But I'm looking at you because I want to see who is here. I may know something about you and send up a quick prayer about you if I know there's a struggle in your life. But I, I'm, I'm doing my best. Elliot's doing his best. We're doing our best to notice you. One precious soul at a time. And now we have more people that are doing that. And together, you get the idea here, right? Church attendance is critical in your walk with Christ. Without staying young at heart. Having that childlike faith. Look at Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, James and John are like, it's me, it's me. You know, and he called a little child to him. And he placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 21. Jesus has just sent out 72. He has given them instructions to go share his love. And he has warned them that some may reject the message. So you do your heartfelt best and then you move on to receptive hearts. He even gives them the power to perform miracles in his name. And after they come back, they're like little children on Christmas morning. They are so excited 
about what they have witnessed, what they have experienced. They have been able to perform miracles, and they're, they're just thrilled to give Jesus the update. And Jesus just gets full of joy, and this is how he responds. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. You may not, we're going to grow one year older this year. For some of us, that's not a big deal. For others, the years are going by faster and faster, right? But we can be one year younger this year spiritually with a childlike faith. Get on the floor with your children and grandchildren and put some Legos together. You know, laugh, run around the house, make fun of yourself. You know, j just, just be a moron, you know? Just, just enjoy life, live it up, be creative. Don't let fear get in your way of embracing what children are just so brave to pursue. And you're like, just wait till you get older. We're so good at ruining it for them, aren't we? You know, instead, let's look at them and let's learn from them. My goodness, you have a zest for life. You're so clueless, little one. I want to be just like you, you know, get down on their level and be like them. I love this, this man, Jonas here, who has so much zest for life. Sometimes he, he loses his temper and he, and he gets mad. But I was the same way, dude. I used to get in trouble for throwing fits. I like strike out three times in a baseball game and people started to duck because the bat was flying, right? So I get that. I understand you, but I love your passion and your energy. We can learn from you. We can learn from your energy for life. What about this? Never say amen in your prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I once asked a girl when I was campus pastor at Northern Christian School to say a prayer at the end of a chapel service, and she said, well, Pastor Rich, do I have to say amen? That is a strange question. I have never heard that one. What do you mean? Why would you be opposed to saying amen? And she goes, well, my prayer life is like a conversation with God. I never end it. <laughs> right? I'm like, wow, that's a perfect example of what I mean by learning from the younger generation, right? She never says amen. Practice this year. Maybe this is a spiritual resolution you need is for your prayer life to become more conversational. Well, you're just talking to God throughout the day. So, God, this is Monday. I am dead inside. Please help me. Please remind me that I'm not alone this day. Could you please show me someone I can encourage and build up today? Someone that, even though I can't believe it, feels worse than I do right now. Jesus, I need you. Just talk to him. Throughout the day, ongoing conversation. All right, here's some keys to success. Because how many of us have started a New Year's resolution and then did not finish it? <laughs> my new, year, new Year's resolution is to keep my New Year's resolution. I don't know what it is. I just know that's my resolution is to keep the resolution, right? How about this first one? Remember that Jesus did the heavy lifting. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know we spiritually, spiritually, we are called every day to take up our cross and follow Jesus. But it is not a physical cross. He carried the real deal. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. When we're baptized, we spiritually die. We're buried in that water. We're raised from that water. That's our resurrection. But again, it's symbolic. 
we're not really being nailed to a cross. Jesus did the heavy lifting. So do not beat yourself up. Instead, celebrate that he did the heavy lifting for us. Yes, we're spiritually taking up a cross, but Jesus, you actually did. Spiritually, we're being crucified, but he really was crucified. Celebrate that he did that for us. Don't feel guilty about it. Just be fully aware that when you're struggling to carry a burden, that Jesus is there with you and he truly understands. He does not just carry that burden spiritually. He did literally. Literally. What about this? Ask for help. Ask for help. Just like I'm going to ask Jackie to say stuff to me I don't understand. You know, oh, I skipped the last three days, or maybe I would understand what you're saying to me. It's just gibberish. Um, but hopefully over time I will learn. I will appreciate her encouraging me. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We're all needed in this place. Like what I was saying about church attendance as a body of Christ. When you are growing spiritually, that encourages me. I celebrate that with you. When you are active and you're serving in the church and Elliot and I see you getting involved, man, it encourages us. We, we'll actually say something to each other at the end of the service. Did you see so-and-so? That's so cool that she's getting involved. Maybe that means she's going to stick around because that's a big deal to sticking around. Is serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus, having an investment, giving back to a church that has given so much to you. Having some ownership, some stake in the game, right? It makes a difference. Ask for help. You are not alone. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, yeah. Therefore, we do not, uh, no, this is a, no, this is our next uh, key to success. Learning to see, learning to see eternally. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. And when we think of unseen, we think of heaven. But what about unseen as in future generations? We, have, we are in the kingdom of God now, not in its fullness, but we're already experiencing this eternity where death will be that, that door we go through to begin our eternity. But what about the unseen being future generations, your family tree, for example? You know, I think about this uh, young man in our youth group. He was here at first service, Stephen, uh, coming to church on his own. He gets married someday. He has children. They continue going to church. Someday Stephen's a grandfather. Someday they go to a family reunion where you see a bunch of people you don't know and that family tree's on the wall and someone following Jesus points to that family tree and says, that's where it started. My great-grandfather, Stephen Warren. And now I'm a follower of Jesus. So you're praying. You're seeing the unseen, even future generations. Uh, what about... You are new and improved. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Um, this is every day. This is not a New Year's resolution. There is a newness continually unfolding when we walk with Christ. There's this fresh start, this do-over. Because we are a new creation. And yes, physically getting older, maybe spiritually, hopefully getting younger. Here's the final key to success. And this does not even sound like success. You will fail. You will fail. You're going to mess up. Regardless of what your New Year's resolution is, you're going to miss a day. Uh, you're not going to understand. Something's going to happen. Uh, the surprise in your life that stands in your way. But look at Isaiah 43. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. 
Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Lamentations. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You have that fresh start. You are not alone in this pursuit to go deeper in your faith, whether it's by losing weight or it's by reading the Bible, whatever it is that speaks to you today. Know that, yes, you are going to fail, but you're not a failure to God. He understands he's there to lift you up again. He's not an I told you so God. What were you thinking when you made this resolution? Did you actually believe you could do this? I told you so. That is not our God. We do not serve an I told you so God. He's a God that's ready to lift us up again, to say, you got this, I'm with you, I'm in your corner for life. And we need to claim that promise as we move forward. And then finally, just some encouragement. Um, there is so much negativity right now. And boy, it's so easy to weigh you down. You heard Pastor Elliot mention a few sermons ago that he deleted his Twitter because he couldn't sleep at night. He was having insomnia because of all the stress from the Twitter. And he deleted it, and he's been sleeping uh, like an angel, like you're, you're so much more beautiful than you used to be. Yes, yes, the beauty sleep is working great. You just have a glow and a hue, a hue. Yes, except for the back of your head. Yes, yes. But, but listen to this passage in Revelation. We need to be reminded of something, and then we'll close in prayer. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, we talked about that, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and end. To the thirsty I give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. We are on the winning team. You've heard that phrase, and it is so true. Love has already won, and love is winning. And when you dwell in the past, you are missing opportunities to show that love because all of these new year's resolutions prepare us to be more outward focused and less self-centered so our lives can be poured into the lives of others but when we camp when our mail is being sent to those past mistakes we are potentially missing divine opportunities divine appointments um, to make 2020 just a more positive year for all of us than maybe 2019 was. Maybe we don't solve world problems, but one precious soul at a time, starting with yourself, as a body of Christ, we can be that light for Jesus together. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word, and thank you for your great faithfulness in supporting us as we seek to be perfect, <laughs> as you are perfect. And knowing in advance, we will fail. We will. But Jesus, you are not there to say, what were you thinking? You're there to lift us up. Love lifted me. And your love has won. So Lord, as we go into 2020, I do pr pray spiritually, uh, we'll learn to see the unseen and recognize that decisions we make, how we live, that we should always be learners, always have a learner's heart. Have humility about things we don't know anything about. Ask questions. Whether we're 15 years old or 95 years old, always be seeking to grow. 
So, Lord, if it's to get fit, to remember that our body is your temple, whatever the New Year's resolution is, to read the Bible, but not feel pressure that we have to somehow do it in a year. There's a, we're told in your word that a year to uh, a thousand years is like a day to you. You're timeless. You just want us in your word. So, Lord, as we move into this season of prayer, Lord, I'm challenging whatever that one or two resolutions we heard this morning that we need to embrace, maybe one we did not hear that we've already picked, that we'll go seek out prayer. And maybe that first resolution is just, Jesus, I've never given my life to you. I've doubted you. I've been opposed to organized religion, and you have my attention now. And I want to go into this new year of following you, calling on your name, making you Lord of my life. Pastor Elliot and I will be down front to receive you, to help you invite Jesus to be Lord and Savior. So Lord, we love you. Bless this season of prayer now. Help us take full advantage of it. But first we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the power.